Sumasu Nakoshi is a man split between worlds, a suit homeless, a person recently laid off who finds themselves having lost everything that once made them, them. Someone unable to define themselves as they once did. He spends his time in the park, his evening resting around the fire, eating with the others who have found themselves by circumstances of life in a similar situation to him. He leaves his car at the edge of the park next to the hotel he used to conduct business in and sleeps in it every night instead of setting up a tent with the others. Unwilling to fully enter and join into this life that he has found himself a part of. The last pleasure he truly has is his evening drives where he just goes out into the city to exist by himself and its energy, but he is quickly running out of money to fund this. One night, there's a knock at his window. A distinctive looking blonde person stands there in eclectic dress and tells him very plainly that they would like to pay him 700,000 yen to undergo a procedure. They say they have developed an interest in the old practice of trepanation which was the idea that drilling calculated holes in someone's head could increase blood circulation and improve pressure in the skull, leading to a clearer essence of being and even possibly other added benefits, such as ESP, and the ability to see things beyond the normal range of human perception. They don't want to undergo this themselves though, but are curious to see what will happen and are willing to pay a high price to witness this. It won't hurt, they tell him, you're given anesthetics, so there's no pain. They just drill the bone. It's like drilling a tooth. Hesitant about the whole thing, Nakoshi talks with one of the local men in the park, who says that homelessness is an existence in which you are forced to live in a world in which returning to a life of dignity requires you to sell your own body for the pleasures, well-being, or curiosities of another that many men in the park have resorted to selling their organs just so they could continue to live. After his car is towed away, Nakoshi is in a state of absolute despair. And after he is tempted again with a nice dinner in the elegant hotel next to the park and a room to stay for the night in an actual bed, he decides to go through with the operation. Afterwards, while recovering, he feels as if nothing has changed. No new perceptions, no insights deeper than what he possessed before. Even after visiting areas that are supposedly haunted or testing for psychic abilities through the use of cards with symbols on them. But one evening when he's out on the street, the wind blows and dirt flies into his right eye. And while it is closed from the pain of it, he sees the world in a new way through his left one. He sees people as they truly are. He has gained the ability to view a person's homunculus, or their person within a person. The true identity of who we really are stripped away from social expectations that we keep for ourselves in our most intimate moments and hide away from the rest of the world. In this way, homunculus by Hideo Yamamoto is similar to being a Japanese take on 1988's They Live a story examining class, social economics, and personal identity through the eyes of someone who has been granted the ability to look past the fake exterior and view the soul of what they are beholding. The symbolic physical manifestations of a lifetime of psychological trauma, as well as the internal desire of how the person views the purest version of themselves within. Their own personal image formed from the experiences of time and self-perception. A Yakuza boss presents as an indestructible mech, who eventually, after being confronted with the events of his past, crumbles to reveal a damaged child hiding within it. A woman who was abused by her previous husband appears to have sucked her neck down into her body so that it is no longer vulnerable. A young backroom parlor underwear model is made of sand because through situations of life, she has learned how to adapt to fit any mold that she has to to get by. Her inner perception of herself is unsure and shifts from moment to moment. Her controlling mother later grows spider legs out of her back and verbally and physically breaks her down and attempts to reform her into the type of daughter that she wished she had. A man walks about with clouds forming around his head, wishing that he was taller than he actually was. Another has grown hands that cover his ears, not wanting to hear anything that anyone has to say. And it is here that we begin to view Nakoshi in a different light, 
As when we met him at the beginning of the story, he is instantly likable and relatable. We want the best for him. He has a certain charisma about him that immediately endears him to you. But there are several red flags that first stand out. One character offhandedly mentions to another that they feel like Nakoshi is a compulsive liar. And even though we see things from his perspective, he feels distant to us as well as to the others in his life. He is a being that we watch voyeuristically, but don't at first get to fully know. And unfortunately, like a lot of charming and superfluous people that keep you at arm's length away, Nakoshi, underneath the guise that he presents on the surface, is kind of a massive piece of shit. His behavior in certain ways is traditionally deviant. He has a low opinion of women and oftentimes does not see them as being on the same level as him. He has a history of severely abusing the people around him, emotionally, economically, and physically. And after he gains this ability to see what he believes is the inner soul of others, he takes it upon himself to try and help these people who appear to have a homunculus. To try to reconcile the two dual images that make up their identity, unifying the outer self with the inner self into one confident being that is more happy as a result. But his methods of doing this usually range from being unkind at best to outright monstrous at worst. And the series asks us over and over again if we should ever take it upon ourselves to help others on their own personal journey of figuring out who they are as a person, or if that is a path that must always be taken alone. If getting involved in someone's life could end up hurting them in the end, and what Nakoshi sees within these people very well may not be what is actually within them. He may be reading these symbols that he sees the wrong way. We only ever see things from his perspective, and so we never really can know for sure. The first time that he really interacts with the homunculus in this way is the previously mentioned Yakuza boss. And after berating him and getting to him on a deep emotional level, he is able to break through the exterior and reveal the damaged child at his core. And through that, the man is able to heal and become a happier person by having reached something that he had locked away deep inside himself. And when Nakoshi looks at him through his left eye, he now looks no different than he does through his right. In that way, he is successful. These two ideas of the exterior and interior have been unified. The Yakuza boss no longer has anything to hide. But was the method of getting there a good one? Is it ever okay to break someone down to try and build them back up again? I don't personally believe so. And the manga does not ever give us an answer either. This is a piece that is more concerned with asking us questions to think about rather than providing us any actual answers. The girl, Yakuri, is constantly wavering in her perception of herself. When Nakoshi looks at her through his left eye, she is a constant turmoil of identity. The sand that makes up her body shifts back and forth on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And he takes it upon himself that in his opinion, she has no clear image internally of who she is and that she needs more confidence in her standing as a woman. He tries to free her through rape. After what he has done to her, before he drives away after dropping her off at her house, he looks up to see that she is looking down on him from her window longingly. A slight flirtatious smile is upon her face, and through his left eye she no longer takes the form of sand, which to me is clearly an indicator of some really harmful views on the author's part that this might even be a weirdly self-insert fantasy of himself. There are throughout the story a few instances of this sort of mindset, which honestly isn't completely surprising coming from a manga which began publication in 2003. And while there are some troubling or harmful depictions in places of this story, I think there are also some interesting ideas present within it that warrant discussion. And I'm reminded in this section of a similar type of scene where a woman is sexually freed through rape in Alejandro Hodorowsky's El Topo, which is awful in all of the same ways and says little to nothing in a sociological or symbolic way, and is a storytelling device that should be left in the past. Nakoshi goes through the story trying to help these people through his own methods, and as he does so, he begins to incorporate the pieces of those that he cures into his physical being. After the incident with the Yakuza boss, his arm turns to steel. After assaulting Yakuri, his leg turns to sand. Later on, after trying to assist Mr. Ita, his head turns into a giant egg. Every person he encounters, he takes a small piece from them and then carries them with him from then on. 
A similar idea to what Ralph Waldo Emerson was getting at when he said, I cannot remember the books I have read any more than the meals I have eaten. Even so, they have made me. Both Nakoshi as a character and Homunculus as a book are obsessed with images and perceptions. Both how we view the world around us and how we view ourselves, and how those two ideas relate to one another. He compulsively attempts to bring about the unification in these people of the images of how someone feels internally and what they project to the surface. And this becomes all the more interesting when we learn that Nakoshi himself grew up very self-conscious about his own physical appearance and never felt comfortable within his own body, resulting in early adulthood and him receiving cosmetic surgery to alter his looks into becoming more in line with how he felt internally about himself. He even burned all of the older photos of what he once looked like because they made him uncomfortable and unhappy to look at, erasing all evidence of this previous form of self from existence, that he didn't feel properly represented who he actually was. And in a way, what he is attempting to do for these people that he encounters is a form of what he did for himself to achieve happiness. Nakoshi at one point becomes so obsessed with seeing the real truth in people that he undergoes an additional operation to blind his right eye so that he never again has to see the illusion that we all experience as the real world, in which people are forced to broadcast false or altered versions of themselves onto the surface depending on the situation. He wants to always see people as they really are inside. His friend Ito tells him that, the fact that you want to know other human beings basically means that you want to know yourself. When this is not enough for him, Nakoshi becomes infatuated with the idea that the hole in his head needs to be bigger, that these abilities will be enhanced with the size of the hole. If this is what he can see in people with a 3mm hole, imagine the possibilities that could come with a 7mm one, or 9mm. Or perhaps, if that is too dangerous, maybe he could drill multiple holes that are the size of the one he currently has. But we will get back to this in a moment. A phrase that is repeated multiple times throughout the story by several different characters is, I am you, you are me. Out on the streets, he sees crowds of people who all have his face. When he meets his ex, Nanako, again, after several years apart from each other, and sleeps with her, for a moment, she looks just like him, and the next, he looks just like her. They are joined and become one being. We are all, in a way, an extension of each other. We are constantly sociologically defined by everyone around us. And when people are removed from situations, definitions become meaningless. A constant fear that Nakoshi reflects on throughout the story is the idea that what he is seeing is not the internalized version of these people, but instead an amalgamation of reflections of ideas that he himself feels about who he is that he is projecting these ideas as hallucinations onto other people, and that these homunculus are extensions of himself, brought on by possible brain damage that came as a result of the hole drilled in his forehead. And in a way, this can be viewed as a narrative about how we are all connected and view one another, about how we are perceived by others and the different roles that we play in different social situations about how often the things we do not like in others are often disliked because they remind us of ourselves, and how we are forced to manipulate our self-perception for different public interactions to the point that we may no longer recognize who we are. Nakoshi says to himself at one point as he stares at his reflection, if I'm even lying to the person looking back at me in the mirror, then how the hell am I supposed to find the real me? It is ultimately about accepting and embracing your real, true, internal identity, and finding a way to safely synchronize that with the you that is presented to the public world. And that part of the narrative is made most clear through the character of Ito, the person who initially approached Nakoshi about going through this operation. The two slowly build a friendship as the story progresses, and this relationship between them becomes the backbone that holds the story upright. One day when they are spending time together, Nakoshi gets an idea of how he could help Ito reconcile their homunculus. As when Nakoshi looks at them through his left eye, Ito presents as a being made entirely out of water. 
When driving Ito to the hospital, Nakoshi watches as they change their appearance entirely. Removing all jewelry, wearing a more traditional outfit and putting on a wig, switching modes to present as being more acceptable to their father's expectation before meeting with him. And even though it is never outright stated or addressed verbally by any of the characters, I think that it is clear that Ito is water through Nakoshi's eye because of their gender fluidity. I would say that while this is ultimately a comic about a man out of control who hurts everyone that he comes into contact with by physically trying to force an identity change within these people before they want that or are ready for that. But Nakoshi does have one kind altruistic act in this story that he does in his own way. Because in this moment of watching Ito prepare to meet their father, he gets the idea that perhaps Ito has wanted to explore further with this form of outward expression but hasn't known how to go about that. And so he spends the last of his money getting a reservation at a nice hotel and buying new clothes and makeup to try and help Ito ease into playing with identity in a relatively safe environment with a friend. He does research and helps Ito learn how to use the makeup that he buys and tries to be a good supporting person to his friend. And it's fascinating to me to watch what begins as an exploitative interaction based around medical curiosities grow and become a genuine connection that lasts through the end of the tale. A connection that by the end of it irrevocably changes and impacts both of them. This whole sequence to me was genuinely emotional to read and extremely relatable. That demonstrates what I imagine it must be like to publicly try and figure out who you are in this way. In the lobby of the restaurant, Ito feels that overwhelming perception that we can all relate to in some fashion where it feels like everyone is staring at you based on how you are presenting or how you look. Nakoshi recognizes this and tries to help them to be confident while waiting for their table, saying that, even if someone in their mind thinks of you as a man, there is no one who would doubt that you are being true to who you are. And I have to admit that it's kind of fucked up that Nakoshi springs this on Ito without giving a chance to mentally prepare for any of this or to really consent to the whole evening in advance. Ito, before arriving to the hotel, only believes that they are going to get some dinner together. But I do think there is actual, genuine goodness in the intention. I don't believe that Nakoshi has the knowledge of this kind of subject to really understand why this might be a stress-inducing situation for Ito. He is shown in a lot of different instances throughout the story to be kind of an idiot. And I don't think he's being malicious, at least in this sequence. As the meal begins, things start off a little awkward. There is a brief scene before the food arrives where Ito goes to the restroom and feels internalized terror at which door to choose, weighing the merits of both decisions, and how possible theoretical people behind those doors will react to seeing them. But as the evening goes along, things start to feel more natural. And this moment where the server is taking their drink order and treats Ito as he would any other person and doesn't act as if anything is weird or off is the first time that you see Ito experience joy and happiness and actually smile. In this scene, once Ito begins to present confidently, they no longer look like water through Nakoshi's left eye. The inner self and outer self have been synchronized into a single image. And while I do not personally understand what it is like to be in Ito's shoes in this moment, I do understand the frustration of having a lack of control over how people perceive you and struggling with the concept of self-discovery of how you feel about who you are. I think issues with self-perception and how we relate to other people and how we fit into society based on preconceived notions surrounded around how we look is something that too can varying degrees be sympathized with universally. And I think this section of the story is really strong for showcasing that particular feeling within it. Ito reflects on this as the evening passes and remembers a time when they were a child, alone in their room trying on their mother's old clothes. And how strong and visceral the reaction was when their father burst into the room and caught them doing this. And how, ever since that moment, the relationship they had with their father was fractured. And that this was probably the primary reason that they never ventured into exploring this again. And this whole sequence where Ito looks back on this and reflects on their life is tragic. The last scene of the evening is in the hotel room later as Ito sits by the window, playing She Loves Me, She Loves Me Not with a flower, saying with each petal, man, woman, man, woman. From here on, Ito presents as both male and female in different scenes, 
and comfortably finds a middle place of identity to exist in that fits them and brings them happiness. In relation to this, Homunculus is also a story about the time periods that we all often have to go through, existing within a liminal space of our lives, and the perspectives that one has before and after going through a transitional period of any kind. We get a feel for this while learning about Nakoshi's past and how he was both different and the same before his homelessness. There are aspects of him that have changed and grown through this experience. But the base personality is still there. He still views the world around him in similar ways. He still treats women the same. Except, instead of abusing them in the back of an old car, he used to do it in fancy hotel rooms or his corporate office. He is and was an abuser of all kinds of people. But the way that manifests is different because of the economic situations that now surround him. He was once a banker and talks in flashbacks about acquiring a desperate company's assets, their stocks, land, securities, and foreign exchanges, and selling them for a profit as if they were the organ of the company's dying corpse. It's a crime to kill a man, he says, but not a corporation. When asked how he can deal internally with the fact that hundreds of thousands of people could lose their job if a massive company folded because of the actions and decisions of him and the bank that he worked for. To which he says, Whatever happens to people beyond that is none of my business. Something which he is forced to confront head on when he takes a taxi and learns from having small talk with the driver that he himself once worked for one of the large companies that went out of business because of him and the bank. And this is one of the most brilliant scenes of the book because we don't see the man's face until the last page. As he talks, we see his lip, a quarter turn profile, the back of his head. He could be anybody. And through this, he represents the many faceless people that Nakoshi has displaced with the predatory abuses of his career. This man, like so many others, used to have a good company job, a retirement that they could count on, and now he drives around people who he used to be like, having to move into his son's home just to survive. All that we are left to sit with is a massive panel of the side of his head, as he says of his son, I think he's lost all respect for me. I think ultimately this is a book asking questions about the nature of what it means to be human, and how to live with respect and dignity while trying to survive in a world that is actively working against you. There are a lot of small conversations that characters offhandedly have about this, a memorable one being about how insurance is basically a game of putting a calculated gambling price on human lives. A plot that almost goes unnoticed running in the background of our main tale is that more and more of the homeless people have been slowly disappearing from the park. Those who were initially displaced from their lives are now being displaced from where they took refuge, never to be seen or heard from again. Leaving empty lots in the park with signs that read, no trespassing where tents used to be. One of these people who still remains in the park is Mr. Ita, who when Nakoshi views through his left eye, presents as a giant golden reflective egg. A possible allusion to homelessness largely being a preventable problem that is a result of the actions of outside forces beyond our control. Homelessness is a reflection of the failures of governmental systems, and is not indicative of any laziness or lack of character in the person who finds themselves in that kind of situation. As a person, he has internalized potential of good that he can do for other people, but is constrained by the structures of economic oppression that have been built around him. Mr. Ita once had a wife and a daughter. He had a career as a chef in a nice restaurant. But his wife got sick and she eventually died, and debt started to accumulate and things just fell apart. Now he lives here in the park, cooking meals for the men with what ingredients they can muster. He walks looking down at his feet. He likes to spend his time feeding the local birds and doesn't like to talk about himself. From his past trauma, he doesn't want to think of the events that led to this. And when trying to help him, Nakoshi says, Unless you look back on your past, you won't be able to see your future. We are largely made up of the obstacles we have had to overcome in our lives. Eventually, even the de facto leader of the homeless population in the park, Mr. Take, is gone. The only evidence that remains that they were ever in the park is the dog that kept them company, who is now starving. And the shrine dedicated to Mr. Ita, who took his life out of the shame of having to abandon his daughter, due to his extreme poverty. 
As his friends leave and winter begins to set in, Nakoshi begins to feel more and more alone in the world. He begins to feel distanced from Ito, who is slowly beginning to recognize the path of destruction that they initially set Nakoshi on by beginning the trepanation experiment. And he begins to spend most of his time with Nanako, a woman who he believes he was once romantically attached to, who refuses to admit that this is true if it is. She claims that they have never met before, despite him having clear memories of their time together. Nakoshi is fascinated by her, because every time he looks at her through his left eye, she has the face of a different woman he once knew in his past. Sometimes she doesn't even have a face at all, and can be seen as the physical representation of all women that he has mistreated in his life. Nakoshi, feeling depressed and isolated from the world, wants to share the insights that he has gained with someone. These events have made him more secluded than he has ever felt before in his life. He wants to feel that connection to someone, and share this ability to see another soul with them. He has spent the story relating to other people, but for a change, he wants someone to see him. To feel how he feels on the inside. And in a final act of abuse, he tells Nanako that everything will be okay, and places her in the bathtub, and drills a hole in the middle of her forehead. This doesn't bring her any insight like it did for Nakoshi. At least, not that she can verbalize. She just sits there completely still, motionless. She has almost certainly been lobotomized. The normal disposition of her face changes to be cold and emotionless, her mind seeming as if it's hundreds of miles away. Back in the bedroom in the next scene, Nakoshi has sex with her. She seems to embrace him, I mentioned earlier that when together, Nanako and Nakoshi form into one being, sharing each other's faces. But of course, this is all presented from his perspective. We don't know truly how she feels in all of this, and the last we ever see of her is this shot, lying down emotionless, the hole in her head beginning to bleed and fester. We never learn if she survives this night. Our story ends one year later. Nakoshi is living out of his car by the sea. He is bald and has multiple bandages, covering new holes that he has drilled into his skull. Ito finds him here, and hugs him, and apologizes for setting him on this path. The police have come to take Nakoshi away, and when he looks at them all, he only sees his own face reflected back at him. He no longer sees people as people. His abuses have led him to seeing them, along with the world around them, as merely extensions of himself. They are him, and he is them. Homunculus is a comic that gives us a lot of time to live with these people, to really get to know them on an intimate level. There are a great deal of panels depicting characters just gazing at other characters in the story, but also at us, giving us time to study them and their emotions, showing off Yamamoto's true ability in his character work. Every page of this book is dripping with detail. The mundane setting draws us in and makes us feel comfort for sometimes an entire volume before something horrific happens. And these moments are more impactful because of the oceans of calm between them. There are a lot of chapters that would be mistaken out of context as coming from a slice of life manga, and I kind of love that about this. Some may call it slow, meandering, or aimless, but I think there's a purposefulness in that decision that provokes the reader into thinking about what they are seeing for long periods of time. When you peel back the layers of social labels away from the person like an onion, what remains? Here we see a series of people who are in a transitional period of their life. A girl who is ready to move out of her parents' house and become an adult. An elitist and destructive banker who suddenly finds himself homeless. A medical student who is deciding to share who they are with the world, and deciding what they want out of life, along with many others. People who are all in a series of spiritual rebirths into a new version of themselves. Throughout the story, we see Nakoshi asleep, thumb in his mouth curled into the fetal position. We see him floating in liquid, and he is generally surrounded by symbols related to childbirth and infancy which might stand as a connection for a desire to turn back the clock and return to an older version of himself. A desire to try and do things in a different way, 
or possibly representative of his redefinition of himself and who he is. He tells one of the men in the park at one point that he is, quote, just on a journey to find myself, which is what we are all on and is something that we largely have to do for ourselves and alone. It's a process that builds internally and out of self-motivated human needs. In this book, Nakoshi primarily gets entangled with four lives, two of which he helps and two of which he harms, but all four experience pain as a result of his actions. Because he's trying to force internalized personal growth onto people who aren't quite ready for that next stage of their life to begin, or might not even want that next stage. Just like he wasn't ready to set up a tent and accept that he had become homeless. Homunculus is a series of questions. Questions about how we live our lives, how we treat other people, how we see other people, and how we see ourselves. And primarily asks, what does it mean to be human? So do 